Evening, everyone. Uh, okay, um, uh, tonight's talk is uh, Sandringham Special Apri Project, um, and your um, uh, speakers for tonight are uh, Eric Marshall and uh, Chris Barrett. Uh, Eric is uh, the lead manager for the uh, for the project and. Uh, uh, Chris is, uh, is also a manager with it. Uh, Eric is um, he's an highly experienced beekeeper and uh, he has an interest in uh, working with um, uh, the uh, native bee of the uh, British Isles, um, uh, Apis mellifera mellifera. Um, these credentials, uh, along with um, uh, um, the fact that he lives uh, relatively close to uh, the Sandringham estate uh, made him, uh, 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 gave him uh, um, uh, the credentials, uh, sorry about that, uh, the credentials along with the fact that he lived near to the, live, lives near to the estate um, were, made him a prime candidate for, um, uh, for uh, um, leading the um, the project. Um, so you can imagine when Bibber uh, did sort of uh, um, uh, offer um, Eric the position, uh, they were more than pleased when he, um, he he took he took that he took their offer up. Um, and uh, he went. He's he's gone on to lead the project and uh, build up a. A team around him. Chris, um, he joined the project uh, early in 21, uh, along with uh, another beekeeper, Joanne Simmons. Um, each of each of them brought their own um, skill set to to the uh, to the project, and uh, they quickly became uh, part of the um, management group um, that now oversees. Uh, the day-to-day -day running of the uh, of, of the initiative. Um, so, I think without further to do, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Eric and Chris, and uh, let them uh, get on with their talk. Eric, Chris, thank you very much, Brian. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us as we re count our journey from the start of the Special Apiary Project at Sandringham. We hope it will encourage you to cooperate in small groups to raise your own queens and develop, the re uh, develop and improve your bees. <clears throat> well, what do we hope to cover? I'll just run through quickly what we hope to cover. Um, we've had an introduction, that's fine. Introduction, right? And then our backgrounds, the beginning of the project, something about the Sandringham estate, finding and setting up the apiary and resourcing the apiary. The Abbotton Black Bee project visit that we undertook. And then thinking about what we did in terms of queen rearing, really breeding methodologies. And then how the project developed in year one, at the end of year one, what would we do to upgrade and future-proof the apiary? Our experience and learning in year one, and then Sandringham Flower Show visit, the Bibba Trustees visit, and our experience to date in year two, and how we think we will move forward. So really, back here, our backgrounds. Well, I've certainly been involved with bees a long time. I started as a teenager actually keeping bees. And by the time I went to university, I then had a sort of 15 year break before I started again. A friend um, saw I got a hive on the premises and said, well, I'd like some bees. So that carried on. I spent a bit of effort, um, but failed in attempt to do some bee farming. Certainly learned a lot about bees and all those things. Um, and really since I've been small scale, although that's grown somewhat now, I've been involved in the Bibber project. Um, 
I'll let Chris say something about his experience. Uh, I'm a relatively new beekeeper. I started beekeeping uh, 2018. Um, I was lucky enough to get a mentor through the local beekeeping association. He encouraged me to go to Gormanston uh, Summer School in the summer of 2019. And that's when I saw a number of lectures regarding queen rearing and got an interest in the subject. And when the uh, local association had a talk for, regarding the Aberton uh, project, Eric introduced the Sandringham project and asked for volunteers. And that's where my name or I put my name forward and have been involved ever since. Great, thank you. I'm just to flip through our screen again so I can get back to where we're going to move on. Right, so the beginning. Well, it all looks as though it was um, very well organised. In fact, what happened was I simply asked Bibber whether there's anybody local to me who would um, be interested in working together to rear queens, whereupon it was suggested that maybe I could um, do that at Sandringham. <clears throat> and it had been a, obviously a Bibber, Bibber idea to develop an apiary project at Sandringham that would fit in with <clears throat> what was then Prince of Wales objectives to manage the estate as a fully organic enterprise, farming naturally and sustainably. So in fact, we, we found suitable apiary um, on the site with the help of the farm manager. And we, we've been very pleased with how the sites develop over time. It is, it is I would say, a very suitable place to work. Um, uh, initially, I put a couple of hives there, and I think that'd be winter of 20, would it? Yeah. And, um, in the spring, they weren't very strong, so I brought another two and united them. And then we were faced with the problem of, well, how will we rear any queens if we haven't got support colony? So with the help of the swarm coordinator in the local beekeeping association, we were put in touch with a fair a substantial number of swarms. I think Chris and I collected something like 20 between us in that year and um, they, after we'd isolated them long enough to see they were disease free, became the sort of basis on which we started. <clears throat> so Bibber encouraged me to run the project and um, <clears throat> that's how it's continued. Perhaps you'd like to know a little bit about the Sandringham Estate and Chris will tell you about that now. Okay, um, the, the Sandringham Estate is, uh, as many of you will already be aware, uh, a privately owned uh, estate by the royal family. It's, it's a rather large uh, enterprise, it covers a, lot, a large area. There's roughly 2,400 hectares of farmland uh, directly farmed by the estate. They then have a number of tenant farmers who are... Uh, managing another 4,000 hectares across across the northwest Norfolk. Uh, interestingly, a number of the staff employed by the Sandringham Estate do keep bees. The majority of those that keep them are uh, sort of gamekeepers. Uh, there is one gamekeeper who's relatively close to uh, the position of the, the apiary, uh, but the majority of them are actually on the size of the estate are quite a long way away from us. The, the home farm is organic, um, has been organic for a while. Uh, the, the estate is sort of evolving and changing and it uses a seven year sort of crop rotation. And it's a mixture of uh, agriculture and forestry. They have their own uh, sawmill and the, the main crops are, as it says, wheat, barley, oats, beans, and then there's sort of two years of clover and plantains that and chicory. We've also had uh, 
some phacelia planted nearby. So there's there's some good forage put in for bees. Um, they will uh, graze sheep, for example, on the uh, clover, and um, that they also have uh, a herd of cattle, which the meat is also sold in the local shop and in the visitor centre. Just to the the north of the estate, there's the Ken Hill rewilding project. Uh, and many of you will have seen that on Spring Watch or Winter Watch. And uh, John Emery, who's a, a local beekeeper, he, he has been asked by the Ken Hill uh, management there to manage all the beekeepers that are on the estate. And they have also shown an interest in uh, having black bees predominantly on on the uh, rewilding estate so there is a chance that we can spread spread north over over time the the slide that you've got at the moment gives you a rough idea of the spread across northwest norfolk um, it, like i say it's a pretty pretty large area the area we we're working in is is currently shown on this sort of photograph. You can see where it's showing the visitor center and the Sandringham house. We, we are to the uh, east of that site. And luckily most of the commercial beekeepers that are on the Sandringham estate are to the east of the A149. And we've sort of got uh, sort of almost free reign to use various facilities on the, the west of the A149. Okay, so. Right. Okay, well, the early setup, as I said, was just moving some hives in. <clears throat> but um, during the winter before, I, or during the winter of the first hives in there, I built the John Harding unit, which you can actually see in the left hand, well, on both photos, um, which consists of two colonies <clears throat> linked by it into a middle box, queen excluders both sides. So you can use it for queen right cell raising. <clears throat> um, I supplied the first colonies of bees, built the John Harding unit, we collected swarms, made sure they were disease free before we moved them into Sandringham. And Chris had met a local sympathetic bee farmer who's actually in the Ken Hill area. And he and a helper of his have helped us on occasions during this project. Chris also built some Ben Harden dummy boards so that we could use them as an, an alternative way of queen right um, cell raising. <clears throat> Initially, things were somewhat slow, but but we, Kevin Thorne was invited to give a presentation to the West Norfolk and Kingsland Beekeeping Association at their AGM about the Abbotton Black Bee Project, which is near Colchester. And following that, I was given a few moments to explain what we were trying to do at Sandringham and invited anyone who wished to help. I think, as it says, the bottom three um, people contact me, Chris being one of them, um, the swarm coordinator being the other, and the third person I don't remember because they've never followed up any interest in, in the project. But that was a very good start and um, has enabled us to, to move on. <clears throat> to get some feel for what we were taking on, we went to see the Abbotton Black Bee Project, which Kevin Thorne runs on the Abbotton Reservoir site for Anglian Water. And <clears throat> there was a late start there due to COVID lockdown restrictions. But when we got there, we were able to see the, the hives that they got, the colonies they'd got, and how they were preparing to start grafting we, both of us, handled the colonies, looked in them with others, and um, 
learned quite a lot, I think, by seeing them. They were very, very strong colonies and, and um, very well behaved bees, actually. I don't think either of us got stung on that day. Um, and we had the opportunity to consider the breeding program that they were operating. Um, and this is something you have to consider. Obviously, the, the biology doesn't allow you to do things on a weekly basis normally, but we, we have adopted ideas that Kevin was using, which allows us to, to work on weekly visits. And so on, I, I, as we'll show later, there are various things you do each week to forward the queen at rearing. <clears throat> Chris made a second visit about a month later um, and was able to feed back on that for us. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, uh, as, as Eric has just identified, when we went to Aberton, uh, we, we, we saw uh, various techniques that they were using at Aberton. So uh, we, we had to, uh, sit down and, and try and think about the techniques that we might use on the Sandringham estate. And so in year one, uh, we, we looked at grafting. And uh, if, if I'm honest, to predominantly use the grafting technique. We did try cell punching. Uh, we had various levels of success success uh, with cell punching. Uh, we even went to the uh, sort of extremes of actually manufacturing our own punches and uh, we've even sort of made some prototype punches that we can put protective cages on etc. Um, what we did recognise is that we needed to make sure we had nice young uh, comb for or good comb to, to be able to make a good uh, result from cell punching. The John Harding unit and the Ben Harding, they both worked. They both worked at different times at different ways. And, and that was the learning experience for us in that first year is the, getting the both of those in the right condition. We did have a little bit of a hiccup with the John Harding unit in that there's a queen excluder keeping the queens out of the middle box. And it just so happened that so one of the queen excluders had just moved away and the queen was able to get out of the side uh, and into the middle and we kept having a queenless uh, tower and queens in the middle and was sort of struggling to find where she was getting out and uh, in the end we we found that and cured cured the one the ben harden um i was i was lucky enough to talk to ben uh, directly in ireland and um it was quite interesting that ben harden had actually uh, kept bees here in west norfolk he was based up in uh, walsingham so he could even tell from my accent exactly where i came from which was quite a surprise and um so that, that's where I got the initial information. We use queen right finisher colonies. We, and in the first year, we tended to use uh, little mini mating nukes. They were mating nukes that Eric already had. And um, again, we had various successes with uh, sort of queens disappearing or not getting back, back to the right mating nuke, et cetera. But as we say, it was all a, a learning experience. And the good thing for Eric and myself and the others on the project is we just were able to talk it through and work it out amongst us as, as to, to what was going on. The biggest challenge we had in the first year was actually the supply of uh, the, the native AMN queens. They were a little bit late arriving. So by the time we'd got them uh, into a colony where we had sufficient sort of material to graft from, it limited the number of times that we could actually uh, do queen rearing the first year. But all the same, that whilst we didn't have huge numbers of success in that first year, we learned a great deal as a as a group on what we need to do in year two. Thank you, Chris. 
another few of the cell punches that we we made between us um and then grafting using a paintbrush well i think there are all sorts of ways of doing it um and we're not here to teach how to how to rear queens particularly we're just trying to give you a feel for what happened as we did it um this is the video I think just cut yeah It's more true. Well, there's, there's a couple of shots of me actually grafting, I think. Not that we're suggesting that's the ultimate um, exhibition of how to do it. it it's something you just have to try and do. And we've encouraged others who've come along to help us to do it. And while they were very diffident about starting, they were surprised how well they got on. And as you can see in here, we were using Nikko um, cups and putting the larvae in the bottom. <clears throat> there is a, something I say, not so much, in that one clearly there's a cell one, one thing we found which was a challenge is that um some one of the queens we were using didn't seem to lay eggs very regularly they were all over the place in terms of age which made it quite difficult to find larvae of the right age to to graph with and, and that, and that's just something that I'd never really appreciated myself, is that at least this queen didn't lay things in a neat pattern. I don't know other people's experiences of this, but a lesson for me was that in fact, this has made me observe things much more carefully than I would have done before. So that's been a, a positive for me. There's an example of one or two queen cells that we actually, had produced and then the cages that we put over them so we we had a cycle which was <clears throat> we'd graft let's say thursday this week next thursday we would put cages on and the following thursday they should be queens <clears throat> um in the cages we check them and then introduce them into mating nukes and so that cycle went on several times i think we only got about four cycles in the first year <clears throat> there again you can see a sort of queen in, in the in the um, hair roller cage left hand end and the hatch cell looking down <clears throat> In cell raising, there's a John Harden Harding unit, which has the two towers and the queenless section in the middle. The Ben Harden unit, which is queen right in the sense of queens below the excluder, um, but um, the upper portion um, behaves as though it's queenless when it's got plenty of young bees and produces or will draw out queen cells if you give them larvae to do it with. <clears throat> Here's, this is the mini mating hive that, that we were using and still do use, um, which just has a top bar and a starter and they draw out the comb and you can see one of the queen daughter queens, nicely dark, um, arrowed. And so just summarizing our weekly schedule, we inspected and prepared cell raiser colonists to receive a new batch of cells. Um, we inspect and prepare finisher colonies to receive a new batch of sealed queen cells and check on the previous week's grafts, punch larvae, move sealed cells to finisher colonies, move emerged queens to mating hives, 
graft and cell punch larvae from a do donor colony, and then check the mated hi mating heights for mature mated queens, as well as inspecting all the colonies if we can, and generally looking after the apiary. And that actually proves to be quite a lot of work. So where did we get in the first year? Well, this doesn't sound very dramatic, but <laughs> all very, very wonderful, but we did manage to produce three daughter queens. What I would like to emphasize that I think we have all realized the benefit of collaborative teamwork. It really does help in, in making sure we thought through what we're doing, that when we get something unexpected on the job, we have we are able to discuss and agree a way forward, and um, that that's been really worthwhile. I think I think our beekeeping skills and understanding has grown immensely, and that, that would be a benefit for anybody um, to to share with someone else. The other thing is, of course, with the number of us who are now involved, we have something like nearly fifty colonies between us all including sandring ones, which means we have a good, a reasonable idea what a good colony looks like. And I think that's very helpful. Um, the other things that we found out, we needed to have our, ac our records more accessible. We were doing them on paper and I held them, which meant that others hadn't really got easy access to them. Um, and we've modified that in, in this year where we've got the, 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 all the um, <clears throat> Hive information on Dropbox so anybody can access it and see what's happening. Every, every, for every visit we made, I produced a task list um, and generally it was carried out, although sometimes we didn't manage to do all the jobs we'd got lined up. Problems have arisen, well, our queens didn't arrive till late June. We got a relatively poor level of graft acceptance and loss of queens in sealed cells in finishing colonies. I think our consensus view is that we really didn't get enough young bees in the right place. And that's certainly been our focus since. We do that partly by moving, and we'll do that, by moving sealed brood from the brood in it, we use a double brood box system with an excluder between we move seal brood up every week above the queen exclude and return empty frames down below for the queen to lay up. And this year we will also have support colonies so we can add extra frames of sealed brood to boost them. So that we've got large, very heavily biased young bee colonies, <clears throat> which we think will help. We lost some virgin queens from mini nukes, use for mating, and some of our seal queen cells got neglected. But, but all in all, it, it was a good year, really, given the, the late start. Obviously, between then, as, was that what, 20 to 21? Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. 21 to 22. No, 21 to 22. Um, things were to be done in the winter, so there was hefting hives, feeding, bon varroa monitoring and treatment, and we did oxalic acid treatment <clears throat> that winter. Chris also got busy, I found some wood and he got to work and we built some stands, which have proved very useful, and that enabled us to reorganise the whole apiary. As you can see, we've got the stands, hives on them, and we put up what's a windbreak. It's a rockoline screen, really. Um, the real value of that for us has been that you can park the car this side of the screen where we're standing, as it were, in the picture, uh, this side of the screen, and the bees fly up high so we can sit on the back of the car and graft larvae quite happily without any bees bothering us at all. So it's been very useful. In year two, we 
We're going to graft, sell punch, use a Nico Cup kit, John Harding, Ben Harden, Queen Wright finisher colonies. We also experimented with the Queenless cell razor as well. Um, more mini mating nukes, some of which were ab abalos, and <clears throat> more native queens because we had a bit of a problem with one of ours became a drone layer. And the other one was superseded. So by the time we got to year two, we haven't got any sort of um, AMM queens, which Joe Widdicombe gladly supplied us with. Um, and training. That was we we were we recognised one of the things that even though we were starting the project and already a year into it, there was uh, an opportunity to go on some training. And we, one of us went down on to uh, one of the Biver run queen rearing sessions. Uh, so and it, it was me actually, I went down and uh, spent the day down there. And it was great to see uh, some slightly different techniques also, uh, confirm that the type of approach that we were taking was the right type of approach. We saw a very similar apiary um, and a very similar in sort of setup. And um, it all also gave us some clear uh, sort of indicators on where we might go in, in year three. And uh, one of the things that it's going to allow us to do is actually sort of settle on what is the right technique for us moving forward, because we've tried all of the different ones and we've had varying degrees of success, but um, we've, we've got perhaps more of an idea where we need to settle it coming in, into year three. Good. Our aim for year two would have fun and learn to produce enough daughter queens to requeen all the colonies with the sandring of apiary, produce some excess ones, hopefully to provide them for the estate beekeepers, and allow us in year three to have colonies which were producing AMM drones. We think we, we ought to, we thought then and still do think, I think to bring in more AMM breeded queens from other sources than the one we were using, not that we, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the ones we use, but we felt we needed genetic diversity. Um, we also hope to increase effectiveness and efficiency of our team working to maximize our output. Yeah. And recruit some willing volunteers and then do some promotion amongst other beekeepers and the general public. Just um, some of the things we've used or used in year two, we Bibber paid for some Abelo mini hives and you can see what they look like, polystyrene. Um, and you can see that they're divided, have a divider down the middle. So you can notionally mate a queen in each side. We've ra we ran into, or have come across a problem with that is that if you open the top then a queen from one side can run up over the frames and down into the other side which is curtains for the queen so we we've worked with chris has actually developed some little cover boards that we can put on so that you can deal with one side and then deal with the other side <clears throat> something we did with abelos here was to overwinter one and you can see it's what six boxes high. I think one, two, three, or five. One, two, three, four, five, six boxes high. And it, it came through, went very well, and gave us the opportunity. You almost in every level, provided you haven't got the queen in, problem is finding her, but um, <clears throat> that's another story. Um, you can separate each box, and then you've effectively got two mating colonies already set up and running. You don't, not even shaking bees and anything like that. So that's been quite useful. And we've got one or two this winter coming through, which not as tall as that, though that one's there with three on, I think. We've got two or three under another apiary. 
They, that's what they look, and you can see some very nice comb there produced in an abelo, <clears throat> nice arc of um, stores and pretty good sealed brood. And in fact, over on the right, there's an AMM Welsh store to Queen. That's Chris had a Welsh AMM Queen and did some Queen rearing at his own apiary. And there, there she is. And that which you don't see very often is um, the Queen just returned from a mating flight, which we thought you'd like to see. We had a go with the Nico Cup kit. Many of you will no doubt be familiar with it or know about it. Um, and we had very, very varying experience. Chris's Welsh AMM queen laid it up in 24 hours. Our Cornish AMM queen wouldn't even do anything in it twice, several, two or three days. And talking around, that seems to be a not uncommon experience. Some queens will do and some won't. And you can't make them if they won't. Any of you looked at the NatBit website or part of the website will know that there's a record sheet. It's very comprehensive. We've used it. It seems to do the job. And um, that's how we keep the records. But as I said, <clears throat> we do that online now. I, we make notes on site and I bring those back and then transfer them to the to the record sheet for each hive. And that we're about to analyze last seasons just to see what we think were the best colonies. <clears throat> Um, it, obviously, we've been breeding queens. We need to sort of introduce them at various times. We have uh, distributed queens to some other beekeepers. Uh, we've used all the techniques. I, I tend to use the pushing cages myself. I've found uh, sort of a much better success with those uh, in general. Um, allows the queen to get laying and the, the bees just generally seem happier with them. But uh, yeah, we've used them, used them all. And um, like I say, generally uh, had reasonable success with all of them. That's this year. This year, our yeah. learning this year to date. Is that really right? Yeah. What about Santa? Oh, That's obviously actually. the wrong presentation. Oh, no. Right, so our learning this year to date. Well, it's ongoing. We're always learning something new and the opportunity to talk together about it is good. Um, we realize that if you want to rear queen successfully, you need a good nectar flow or some feeding of the colonies to promote the right conditions. And um, the other thing that we thought we would do next, this coming year is to change our schedule so that we complete the graphs and punching, whichever we're using as the first activity. Which that gives us an opportunity to do a quick check on the acceptance level by the time we're leaving the apiary because they, they make that decision pretty quickly, it seems and ensuring starter colonies have plenty of young brood and lots of young bees, particularly. Carry on. What have we achieved this year? Well, we've reorganized the apiary. We managed, we put 14 colonies into winter. Um, most of them, I think one's gone, but that, we understand probably why. We've done three rounds of queen rear, well, more than that now. We did about 10. Yeah. The interesting thing is that the weather didn't help us. We got to the point when the weather was very hot where the bees would not rear queens. And indeed some sealed queen cells were torn down. A few other information I've picked up talking to other beekeepers, particularly 
particularly queen rearers, is that probably the temperature got too high because I understand if you're rearing queens or hatching queens in an incubator, the, the temperature level is quite critical. If you go up a degree or so more than you should, then they don't hatch, they die. We have five mated queens at reared at Sandringham, 13 daughter queens at Massingham. So that's... That was at the end of June. At so end of by June. the end of August, that had gone up to probably 15. Yes, 15. Yeah, um, sorry, that yeah. was slightly out of date on this presentation here. Um, what's next? I say I want to say something which we meant to have illustrations of, and we've left them off at the moment. There are two things we did. One was to um, have a stand at the Sandringham Show. Sandringham Show is a very popular event. The local beekeeping association certainly exhibit there every year. And it was very interesting. There was a lot of interest in what we were doing, a lot of interest. Um, and we plan to do it again this year, all being well. The other thing was that we were keen, very grateful that the Bibber trustees um, came and had a look at what we were doing. So we had a kind of peer review, which is always a helpful thing to have. And um, a lot of encouragement, we're glad to say, for what we, where we're going at the moment. Moving forward. Good record keeping, particularly being able to identify the daughter queen's traceability, where they came from, ensuring diversity of the gene pool that we have, establishing some outlying colonists to flood the area with um, AMM drones, Two of our help, well, three of us actually live in Castle Rising, which is um, about less than two miles as a bee flies to the, the southern edge of the Sandringham estate. And all, all of us are, move, are moving to black bees. So we will have a very large proportion of black drones in, in, the, in the south of the estate. And we hope to, well, we more or less are actually um, requeened on the 8th Sandringham Apri, so we should be producing AMM drones there, <clears throat> which will help um, the mating. We want to assess our colonies for potential local breeding and <clears throat> where we think we've got useful daughter queens, try to fit in some wing morphometry just to see how they're matching up to AMM standards. We'd like to educate any local beekeepers who, who wish to um, have a look at what we're doing and demonstrate the positive attributes of AMM bees. We hope that we might get a second AMM apiary on Ken Hill Um, state. We have a, well, John Emery, who has helped us, is a bee farmer there and is keen to do that. And hopefully we will have enough AMM queens this year to distribute and sell. Uh, one of the other things that we should be in a position to do in come the spring is that we'll have enough potential uh, breeder queens that we can start to be far more selective um, in which queens we actually breed from. So we'll be able to assess, assess them early on and, and choose the very best. When you only have one or two, you're obviously very limited, but uh, moving into 2023, we will have at least six uh, breeder queens that we can potentially uh, use. So that's, that's another aspect of what we, we're trying to look at moving forward. Fine, I think that's it. Okay, so over to Brian. Right, okay. Okay. Can everybody see me now? Yes, I can see you, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was great, uh, Eric, Chris, um, and uh, I think uh, 
Um, I, I've actually sort of been involved at a distance with with the um, um, with with this project, um, mainly uh, just uh, liaising between Bibber and yourselves. Um, so a lot of that you've covered tonight. Uh, um, <clears throat> it you know it, I, I am familiar with, but. Uh, Nevertheless, it just it, it amazes me how much you've done in the in the time you know that the, the project's been going, um, and uh, and uh, it's great to see that uh, you know you've got the the future plans are uh, um, are in place. Um, I don't know if any questions have come in. I'll just have a look at the questions. If there's anything. Eric and Chris, do you want to try popping your uh, video back on now? Yeah. Uh, chat. Let's have a look. Hmm. Why won't any questions come up? Ah, there we go. Um, okay. So yeah, well, the first first question I think I think Chris I think um, Richard you might just uh, need to answer this. Uh, some uh, questions come in. Um, uh, I believe it's from Colette O'Connell. Uh, how can we access the recording of this webinar? Yeah, so the recording of the webinar will go up in about a month's time onto our YouTube channel, uh, so that uh, people can revisit uh, revisit the recording. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Eric, Chris, um, Terry uh, wants to know uh, what do you consider are the main attributes of the AMMBs? Well, that's <laughs> that's a question off the cuff, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> several things. One is I think they're better adapted to the environment that we have in the UK. They are very, tend to be frugal over the winter. As far as we can see, they, they build up quite quickly in the spring. They're very gentle to handle, very nice bees to handle. Um, do, you, do you find, uh, sorry, uh, Chris. You're all right, you're, you're fine, go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you, do you find um, that the that um, when you say the 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 they tend to be frugal, um, are, are you not putting uh, uh, much feed on them or any feed on them in the winter? Well, we did put feed on this year because the, during the very hot weather they weren't gathering anything and they ran the storm yeah. down at a terrific rate. Yeah, <laughs> almost caught out. In fact. Um, <clears throat> All our hives we've set up with um, an empty box underneath the brood box and an eek on top. And we usually put some candy there so that it's available on the top of the frames if they need it. Yeah. But they're not, they are taking it, but not sort of stripping us out. And even when they are, all the colonies, pretty well all the colonies have got plenty of stores anyway. They're still quite reasonably weighty. Right. I think one of the big observations that I, I can see at home is uh, where I have black bees and I have uh, some, some quite uh, golden bees, to be fair. Uh, Richard has actually had the pleasure of seeing one of the queens at Sandringham. She's very, very gold. The black bees are flying at a much, much lower temperature. Yeah, um, they're, yeah. they're, they're out early in the morning, uh, much yeah. earlier than the others. And um, they, they quite clearly seem happier in, mm. in that sense. The, you know, I've, I was always told the colonies are very small. And, and just out of interest, I've put uh, one colony into a 14 by 12. And she's absolutely filled that in no no trouble at all. And it's been a sort of a huge colony over the summer. So I think it's it's all down to how you manage them as to what the size that you, you're ultimately going to have with them. And um, I tend to manage them very much as in the way that Roger would advocate with having a support colony and 
boosting them all the time through the year. And that's that's what I've done. And I've had big colonies as a result. Yeah. This, um, this week, um, my bees, which were definitely AMM or daughter queens, were flying at about temperatures about 6.5. And there were not many, but there were bees. And one was bringing pollen in. Yeah, I've noticed this. Um, I mean, I'm in the Midlands, and uh, today it's been, by and large, it's been a, a really cool day, but my bees were flying, you know, and uh, they're, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. Um, right, Simon Tuck, um, what was the local resistance uh, you initially received? I presume that's um uh establishing the apri um i mean i don't know I think is that was probably reference i think some some i mean i think having talked to the local beekeeping association i think it'd be fair to say that some members were not much convinced about black bees yeah so and there, there will always be that divide when people have their own views about what's good or what's not good um i think we should my philosophical reason, if you like, for doing it is that we should aim to run um, natural, the natural order that fits the climate and terrain that we're living in. And bees from Italy aren't, were never designed <laughs> to work in the UK. We just have a different environment, different seasons. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I uh, I presume uh, the 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 as beekeepers on the estate that uh, there are not sort of keeping um, native bees currently native bees. Um, uh, do you have any any sort of do you li liaise with them at all? Do you have any 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 you know uh, yeah, uh, contact with them? We we cle we clearly there is there are staff that. Uh, have their bees and that they'll have had those bees for some time. And, and as you can sort of well imagine, uh, some of them are uh, a little bit resistant to the idea that black bees are being taken onto the, the estate. Um, it's, it is the objective of the estate management to have black bees on the estate and Their, their view is that they will work with, with the beekeepers on the estate to, uh, to sort of make that happen in a progressive way. So no, nobody will necessarily be forced to change, but they might be restricted where they can have the bees on the, on the estate over time. So they, they might well be pushed further and further east, as it were, um, over, over a period. But that's, that's all relatively new. And and as as you you'll be aware, Brian, there there is a a local bee farmer who has some reservations about it. And obviously, one of the things that we have to do with the project is anybody's welcome to come and look and look at the bees and handle the bees and mm. see how the colonies are. It's it's open, you know. If anybody contacts, they they're more than welcome to come and have a look. I mean it. There are security issues. We can't just wander down there as and when we please. So we do have to check in with the security and the police, etc., to to be able to get to the bees. But it, it's not prohibitive. Any anybody can can join us and at any time, you know, and uh, come and have a look. Yeah. So if there are local people who are listening in, if they want to. To come and have a look at the project they're, they're welcome they don't necessarily even have to come and volunteer long term but if they want to come and have a look fine yeah they'll be welcome yeah great um okay um you mentioned uh Bibber providing uh a bellow mini new mini plus hives is this available to all groups and if so how do you go about it um, I think that's one for me, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, unfortunately, no, it isn't. Um, uh, the the all, all the Bibbit, the the groups that are registered with Bibbit, um, 
are, uh, operate uh, independent of Biba. We we just offer Biba um, offer Biba's support um, uh, to 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 the groups uh, and uh, and obviously uh, the uh, there's a wealth of knowledge uh, within Biba that uh, we, we can you know we can share uh, in that support. Um, Sandringham is a is an is an actual Biber project. Um, it's and that's why it's termed a special apri project. So uh, it's it's a Biber project and it's funded by Biber. So I think that's the answer to that one. Um, okay, let's have a look. Uh, there's one or two com questions come in now. Um, and attributes, we've read that, you mentioned Biber, yeah. Um, okay, this one here, I found my AMM uh, had have nice small nests, but still make plenty of stores without the need to boost brood. And they have been flying over winter, uh, plus one degree C in Lancashire. So that's uh, another indication of, you know, of how, uh, how, how sort of uh, um, conditioned um, uh, AMMBs can you know are to, to our climate? I guess. Um, I don't know if you want comment on that at all, Eric. Uh, Chris, is there anything you want to say on that one? No, I, it's just that when you're in the queenering mode, it's helpful to maximise the young bees. Yeah. That will that encourages crop comb production and feeding of, of um, larvae. So they're, they're very ready to deal with them. They're all in the mood to produce queens if, you, if, if they are given the impression that they're needed. Yes. Grafts in some, and a bit of separation from the main, where the queen is laying, provides that situation. It's, yeah. it's a limited experience at the moment. For, mm. for us in terms of overwintering we've we've really had only one one winter being last winter obviously we've got this one as we go through it but last winter uh, the bees that i had um i had a mix of if you want norfolk mongrels and some uh, amm queens the amm queens took no fondant at all and yet the, uh, we'll call them the Norfolk Mongols, one colony took over four kilos of fondant to yeah. sell it. And, they, and pretty much they, all the local ones needed some fondant, plus they, they've got all plenty of stores going into winter, but um, the, the AMM uh, colonies didn't touch it. They, I'd put some on, but they never, never touched it at all. And, um, that that was a bit sort of only one season, so I wouldn't like to say that's that's definitely going to be the case this year. We have to wait and see how yeah. things go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, have you had your bees DNA tested for AMM? Sorry, Brian, we've just lost you with that. Oh right, okay. Uh, have you had? Your bees DNA tested for AMM. Ours, no, no. Um, I don't know about the ones that Joe produces. We had them from Joe Widdicombe. I think his breeder queens have been tested at least in the past. Yeah, they have been tested and in the past, validated yeah. as at least ninety percent. Yeah, and AMM. I mean, we. Like him, we, we tend to look at the, the bees that are produced uh, and they're very dark. Yeah. Getting a, towards the AMM, they're very dark. Yeah, the, I mean, they do say, don't, they do say that like colour isn't a, a, a great indicator of AMM, but I've always found that, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, uh, it is an indication, I think, um, the, the the bees are um uh, well there's been a definite change in the color of the colonies yeah, at yeah. Sandringham. Yeah. You know, over, over yeah. the time 
Uh, you know, they, some of them are quite yellow and and they have definitely darkened over over the two years. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it's it's such that um, it's very distinctive. You can see the change. Mm. You, you can identify where we've requeened and where we haven't requeened very, very easily by just looking at them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Sean from Dublin in Ireland here. Uh, I have used nothing else other than AMM, and they are a pleasure to work with. A big well done to Eric and Chris for this really worthwhile project. Thank you. I'll second that, by the way. Yeah. Um, what are the general accepted ways to identify MMN queen bees, queen stroke bees? Sorry if this is basic stuff. Well, every question's relevant. Do you want to go for that one? Oh, sorry, we just lost you again. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, so the question was, um, what are the general, generally accepted ways to identify AMM queen Queen's stroke bees. Well, I suppose the ultimate thing is, um, of course, DNA analysis. We morphometry is another way of giving you a clue. That's quite good, but it takes a little time to do. Um, we the the bees we have take have used as our breeded queens have been supplied by Joe Widdicombe and we believe they are fairly representative of AMM Queens. We, we, we don't have a sort of, there's no kind of ready test you can do. You can't sort of shine some light on them with a piece of equipment and find out that no. they're AMM Queens. Um, but certainly the ones we've had seem to be, and they're always very dark, colored queens and the the offspring that come are very dark colored sort of whitish slightly gingerish hairs around the ab thorax and um they without exception i think they've always been very good to handle yeah yeah and also uh, eric you've i think you've already mentioned so the um uh, also, you've already mentioned the, that they the tend to uh, appear to be more frugal um, with the stores. Um, that's another indication, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that the uh, comb on one of your photographs was, was a, a really nice white, um, white comb, you know, which is... You which certainly is, get that. Yeah, yeah which is, a, which is a, another uh, indication, I believe. Um, and uh, it, it's surprising. It's surprising where you've got colonies from uh, different uh, sort of lineages side by side. That that's where you really see the difference when, yeah. you, when you're looking. It, it's mm. quite. I've I've been quite astounded by just how white the the comb is uh, yeah. uh, compared yeah. compared with some of the other bees that I have. Yeah, I, no, I noticed it on your on, on one of your photos, mm. actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that answers that one. Um, generally accepted ways to uh, any plans uh, to engage the general public stroke community on the advantages of the local black bees and and this excellent project. That's a really good question, I believe. Well, two things I would say. One is um, Sandringham Show. Yeah. It's a fairly, has a very wide audience come through Sandringham Show. Um, we're quite happy to interact with anybody who wants to know about them, but we're not sort of forcing our, <laughs> ourselves on them if anybody wants to know. Yeah. Um, do it. And I think it'll be a matter of, it's a bit a matter of time. If we've got a lot of bees, spare queens, then we will be more keen to get them out and for people to try them out. Yes. Yeah. Have, that hasn't been a, a luxury we have. Yeah. I've, Richard was one. Well, 
was with us at Sandringham and we had a just a constant trickle of people that would, were not beekeepers, just general public wanting to look. And some were really, really interested in the concept that there was even a native bee. It was just new to them that there was a such a thing. So yeah, just to, we, we had uh, two observation hives, one with a linguistic queen in golding as can be the other one with with a black daughter queen in uh, and just the bystanders could see the see the difference themselves it was quite mm. quite marked and it and it was surprising they were very very busy let's put it that way they, the, the observation highs were nearly in constant use all day mm. They certainly were yeah. that, that that opportunity for the public to to see those two different queens side by side to be able to identify. I mean, most people that are general public think that bumblebees are honeybees anyway. So seeing <laughs> uh, seeing a wasp shape uh, uh, in an observation hive uh, blows their mind anyway. But anybody else who's wanting to get the public on side and and to think about it, I would really recommend doing what Chris and Eric did and having two observation hives. You might need to go and borrow somebody's uh, yellow queen um to to put in uh, in one of them but uh, it uh, it didn't have to make a difference when they can see them side by side yeah I, I, i'm a great advocate for um you know taking the message of the native be out to to the general public uh, you know i really believe in that and i think there is you know if the message is 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 put out there then they're in the interest is there you know um and uh and uh, uh, like you say, Chris, I think you find that uh, um, I find as I'm going round and you just mention about um, uh, the native bee, you know, and uh, people's ears sort of uh, um, prick up and they listen, you know, and uh, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, something I, I keep pushing with Bibber and, <laughs> you know, um, I keep banging on about that. So, yeah, um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but I will just uh, perhaps uh, Richard will let us know when, if, we, if we're if we running out of time, but... Um, yeah, perhaps just a couple more questions. Okay, yeah. Uh, Deanna Tasted, um, Sean Dublin. Just bear with me a second, find where I am again. Uh, any plans to engage? Well, I, actually, I think that's the end of the question, so... Um, say what was that last? The, the last question, uh, the, well, that was the last question about engaging with the general public, All right? Um, so, I think we're, we're sort of at the end of the questions there. And uh, but that's been a fascinating talk, uh, Eric and uh, Chris. Um, and uh, thanks very much, uh, for um, uh, you know, for uh, um putting this together um, and it'll be interesting um, if uh, this can be done again uh, in sort of 12 months time and see where the project is then, you know. Um, so yeah, that's great. So I think we will draw a close on it there, Richard, if that's. Uh... Yeah. Excellent. Uh, just a, a couple of things to uh, remind uh, viewers uh, about the NatBit guide and signing up towards the NatBit program. Um, and if you are interested in trying to get involved in working within groups uh, to try and uh, raise some queens, then uh, Brian leads on our, our group section and there's lots of information on the, uh, on the website about Biver groups. So please do go and check that out. But if you've not signed up for the NatBip uh, newsletter, uh, please do do that on the website because it's, uh, it's a useful uh, little read. Yeah, and also I could mention, uh, um, on the, if you go on the Bibble website and go on to the uh, groups page, um, scroll down to the bottom and you'll see Sandringham Project and uh, there'll be more information put on there as, as it comes, comes about um, uh, from Eric and uh, Chris. Um, and also, um, I think Eric's got his contact details there. So if you did want to... Um, contact Eric about the project then uh, that's uh, that's that's where uh, his um, 
his email is um, to do that. So thanks to everyone that's um, tuned in to uh, um, uh, watch and listen to this uh, project and uh, hope to see you again at, the, um, at uh, one of the next um, webinars, Bibber webinars. Thanks very much, everyone.